I'm going to ask you to stand with me for the reading of the word of the Lord. I'm going to go to the book of Hebrews chapter 9. And I'm going to read for you verse 22. Hebrews 9, 22. And as you turn there, I want to remind, remind you that we do have a service tonight at 630 and uh, there's a youth service and so those of you who are our guests if you have the time tonight you can come back 6 30 for a wonderful service here that youth choir again and uh, hear the good word of god hebrews 9 verse 22 and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now I'm going to speak to you from this thought, the unique blood. The unique, i.e. one blood, the unique blood. And let's just ask God to touch us and to give us listening ears. Dear Jesus, one more time, Lord, we're here. We thank you for your loving kindness, Lord, and your tender mercy. We appreciate you. Thank you, O oh God, for Calvary. That you have brought us out of darkness into marvelous light. As we reflect, Lord, on your birth and what it means to us, we're thankful that you thought on us. And the songwriter said, while he was on the cross, I was on his mind. We're thankful, Lord, that you are always thinking about us you've made provision for us to have eternal life oh lord we love and we appreciate you and our hearts are eternally indebted to you for all that you've done we love you lord and we praise you and we lift your name on high your name is known in all her palaces as a refuge and your name lord is a strong tower into which the righteous run and is safe. We thank you for your providence. How you've charted a course for us, Lord. And you're crafting a life that is worthy of your glory. I pray that always, O oh God, we will keep our minds focused on you. And that you would lead us, Lord, along life's path. You say your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Give us light. Even in the time of darkness, oh God, that we might be able to walk in the path that you have outlined for us. Lord, we're mindful of your presence in this place. And I pray that your nail-scarred hand will always be upon us, Lord. Amen. To help us, God, to live, to please you. I pray that the city in which we live, Lord, that you would reach for it, your hand. And Lord, you would draw them with the cords of love. Touch those that are in government position. Those that are in position of rulership and leadership, oh God. I pray that you will influence their minds, oh God. And bend their hearts towards Calvary. Lord Jesus, I thank you for all of your goodness. And we thank you, Lord, that your presence is felt in this place. God, we know it did not have to be like that. But we're thankful, oh God, that... Amen. We're in your presence. And Lord, when in your presence, oh Lord, all the things that we need, you're able to address. You're able to remedy, the oh Lord. I pray that you'll touch those that are close to eternity. Those, Lord God, who come, God, needing an answer, oh Lord, for something that they're struggling over. Lord God, you are the, you are the judge of all the earth. Those may be sick in body. Lord, we know you're the great physician. Dear Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, that when we shall have left this place, we will know that we have sat in your presence. I take absolute authority over this atmosphere. I bind everything that is unlike you. I cast it down, forbid it to operate, and I release in this place a spirit of faith and revelation, O oh God, that you will touch the hearts, Lord, and a spirit of conviction that you'll grip the hearts, O oh Lord, that they will come to a place that they will know you in the power of your spirit. Touch the lips of Claire, pray. And Lord God, when we shall have left here, we will say it was good for us to have been here. Hear from heaven, perform and do. 
as we ask these mercies in Jesus name and all the people say amen God bless you and you may be seated the unique blood something that is unique of course is something that does not have a second or a match but it is unique i.e. it is singular and by itself those properties or qualities are unmatched and has no second I think it is quite safe to say that God has decreed that the soul that sinned it should die and that any atonement that can be made has to be made on the basis of shed blood that is God can only forgive sin on the basis of blood he cannot simply arbitrarily forgive sin if for instance we consider the angels that sin because we're told that a full one-third of the angels sinned and fell with Lucifer but the reason why the angels were never redeemed was the fact that angels have no blood at all they're not human and so there was never an angel that could die and shed blood to remedy those disobedience that caused them to have fallen and so no angel of course can be saved there is no blood provided for them because there is not blood in angel we know also that when Jesus Christ chose to come and to die for us he took on the qualities of mankind that is he became a man that had blood because blood is a prerequisite to forgiveness if there is no blood there can be no forgiveness in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 to 17 we read these words for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage for verily he took not on him the nature of angels but he took on him the seed of Abraham wherefore in all things it behoove him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people so in order for Jesus Christ to have addressed the sin question then he had to have been made like unto man he had to take on the same qualities and characteristics that man had namely in our case blood he had to have blood in order to address man's sin so blood then is the basis of God forgiving all sins if there is no blood then God cannot forgive sins all sins are punishable by death notice in Genesis chapter 2 verse 17 God dealing with our first parents he said the tree 
that was in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge was in the midst of the garden, that were, they were not supposed to eat of it. Notice right now at the end of that, that verse. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. They're going to die because of sin. And specifically, this rebellion. And so they would die spiritually right away. And then physically sometime later, but they would die. That means then wherever forgiveness is found, wherever forgiveness is to be had, wherever forgiveness is given, we must have a corresponding shedding of blood. Because if there is no shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Now many people may recoil just at the thought of blood. But in God's economy, in God's world, blood plays a vital part in God's dealing with mankind. Blood is the central thing that is going to be in view when God has to deal with sin. And so please allow me just to mention four things very quickly in your hearing. Firstly, the establishment of the principle of sin and death. We will see that this is established by God. There's sin and there's death. And that's a principle or a law. So we say then, in the scripture, there is this principle or a law established of sin resulting in death. Wherever there's sin, death follows. This is called in scripture, the law of sin and death. Of course, the ultimate death is eternal separation from God. That is for all of eternity. That is eternal death. Notice in Romans chapter 6 verse 23, the apostle says, For the wages of sin is death. The compensation of sin is death. Whenever we sin, the co its compensation is death. In Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20, God says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. That is God decreeing that. And here, here is the thing that is so serious and far-reaching about this law. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20, Solomon says this, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. That means everybody, even if he is, even if he is, if he is, predisposed to doing well there is some point in his life that he's going to sin and so no one can say that they've never sinned to this Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 agrees Paul said for all have sinned all there is no exemption for all have sinned in Romans chapter 5 verse 12 he continues, he says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So none of us can say we've never sinned. All of us has a proclivity towards sin. Even if we said we didn't sin, we, there is a propensity towards sin and doing wrong things. And Solomon is arguing, he said there's no one that even if he is good, that is exempt from sin. And Paul concludes that all have sinned. So what is sin? Since sin is so pervasive, sin is everywhere. We look in our world and we can see where, where sin is. People may talk well. They may mean well. They may have all kinds of things that they feel is good. But there is this this thing about sin it is like a disease so what is sin 
Simply put, sin is breaking of God's law or his commandments or his ways. In 1 John chapter 3 verse 4, it says, For sin is the transgression of the law. And of course, the ultimate punishment for sin is always death. So, that principle then of sin and death, i.e. sin, brings death. Secondly, God's mercy provides for an atonement for sin. So God in his mercy, since we have sin followed by death, then God says, I'm going to be a merciful God and I'm going to make a provision to address the sin question so that man does not have to die. And so it is through God's mercy then, an atonement or a remedy is provided for sin so that we don't have to die. But it is, com it is, it, it is, it is really depending upon us complying with God's remedy. So just because God has a remedy, it doesn't mean everybody is going to have, take, 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 uh, opportunity to, to comply with that remedy. Some will, but some won't. But the point is, God has made a provision for us to comply, and He has made a provision for us to not die. The remedy, then, or the atonement that is provided is blood. Why blood? Why not some, some other thing? I don't know. I just know that God has decreed that blood is what going to remedy that. If you look in Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. He says for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood. Not ketchup, not milk. Not Sprite, not V8, not some beer. No, it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The blood. So even if you don't like blood, even if you hate the idea of blood, that is what God uses. So we just have to get used to it. The, he says the life of the flesh is in the blood. The blood then is this organ in our body that gives life to all the cells of our body. As that blood courses through our vein, it supplies the life given necessary to keep us alive. This is why we can only, we can only lose so much of our blood before we die. In some serious cases, when people go to the hospital, if they've lost too much blood, they get a blood transfusion to keep them alive. Because if the blood is missing from your life, if it drains from your life, you're going to die. So God used this blood then to address sin. So then if he's using that, what, what takes place? It is the innocent animal, the blood of that innocent animal acts as an appeasement to God's wrath against sin. So when this blood is given, when this blood is applied, when this blood is shed, that is an appeasement to God. It is sometimes called a propitiation. It's an appeasement. When the blood is shed, it appeases God. It, it holds back judgment. If there is no bloodshed, then God's judgment falls. The blood then is a substitute for the life of the one who had sinned. For instance, if you notice in Genesis chapter 3 verse 21, where our first parents had fallen by way of transgression. The Bible says, unto Adam also unto his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. These skin then were from the animals. These were animals that God had to kill to clothe them. And their clothing were twofold. 
first there was the physical clothing but more importantly there was the clothing of the blood for their sin it covered God's wrath from falling it prevented God's wrath and so blood then has always got to be shed in order to appease God's wrath in Genesis chapter 4 verse 4 we see Abel during the process of time the Bible says and Abel also brought up the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof and the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering so uh, so Abel understood the principle sent down to him or transferred to him by his father Adam and said now son whenever you deal with God you always have to address yourself to the sin that you have always bring a blood sacrifice and so Abel did that and his sacrifice was acceptable Cain did not and his sacrifice was rejected because you always have to deal with sin with blood and so we know also that this is pervasive in scripture if you look in Job chapter 1 verse 5 the Bible says and this was the occasion that Job children had had, had gone and come together and Job felt well there may have been some problem the Bible said and it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all for Job said it may be that my sons have sinned and he learned and he knew that if there is sin there has to be blood or else somebody is going to die now it is thought that Job of course predated Mosaic law and so we don't have any reference here of Moses law but Job knew because this principle of sin and death had been passed on orally from family to family and so they knew that if sin was involved then blood has to be be followed or else you're going to be in trouble thirdly this law of sin and death was then systemized by the law by Moses law in our text then in Hebrews chapter 9 we see Paul who is thought to be the writer is telling us that really on a whole on overall uh, over overall when we look in terms of sin and death that the Levitical system was always looking for blood as the means of putting away sin and impurity all the sacrifice whether it was burnt offering whether it was turtle dove whether it was pigeon whatever it was blood was always involved it had if sin was involved then blood was it also involved and of course what's also very interesting is the fact those who hated to deal with blood since you knew you had to deal with blood if you sin then there was really in an encouragement not to sin because the time you sin you had to deal with blood and Paul was saying unless there was the killing of the animal and the blood being then poured out and subsequently on that altar then there would be no purifying of sin when God allowed the atonement then by the shed blood he may he was talking a referring to two things when those Hebrews looked at the shed blood, they knew two things. God was saying two things. Firstly, he was saying to those Israelites that by the blood of animals, there should be a temporal remission of their sins. That remission was be granted just temporary so that instead of dying, that they would live because the law says anytime you sin you die but God says that by but Paul was saying by this this temporary shedding of animals blood it was a temporary reprieve for the guilty Hebrew because these Hebrews of course they were all just as well as we are susceptible of sin and so even if they live for some time eventually they were going to sin and so Paul was saying, well, God was saying to you that I'm going to give you this temporary reprieve by you offering the animal's blood. However, there was one thing that was missing here. 
The fact was, you had animal's blood, and then you had human blood. So, the animal's blood and the human blood is not really one-to-one. -one. Yes, the, the animal blood is, is blood, but the human blood is also blood, but it's not the same. So the animal's blood was only temporary, and what the animal's blood did was this. It did not totally eradicate or totally forgive, forgave sin. It simply rolled the sin to or ahead to Calvary. So the second thing that God was saying to them, that a real spiritual and eternal forgiveness should be granted in faith in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, which the, the slain animal's blood represented. So when they saw all that blood, all of the various pigeon and bullocks and heifers and and goats and rams and lamb all of those blood they were simply represented jesus's blood that would come down the road and so it implies then that there would be no salvation possible for any soul from any walk of life if they reject the ultimate sacrifice for sin even jesus christ so all of the blood, all of those prescription offered by the law, given by Moses, was simply designed to address the sins question of the Hebrew nation. And all the blood that was shed was representation of the future blood that Jesus would shed. So all of the blood. And, and that blood had been offered, been, had been offering for some 1400 years blood the blood of pigeon blood of turtle dove blood of bullock blood of the lamb blood of goats all of the blood that was offered was simply representing jesus's blood that would come it is quite interesting that it was estimated that all of the blood shed upon the jewish altars could actually run Niagara Falls for a few seconds. Now, I don't know how many of you has ever gone up to New York and you look at Niagara Falls, but Niagara Falls, the amount of water that goes over there, million gallons a, a, a minute that goes over Niagara Falls. And it is said then that all of the blood, if you could collect all of those blood that was shed on Jewish altar, you could put it in that place in Niagara Falls and it would actually run that thing for a, a few seconds so there were a lot of blood there but all of that blood all of the blood that was shed on Jewish altar could not permanently wash or forgive sin it was simply, it was simply a temporary a temporary solution to a, a sin question that was always permanent and so the, the blood on Jewish altar simply rolled man's sin ahead to Calvary. So fourthly, the blood of Jesus. We say that all the blood that was shed on Jewish altar was simply a representation of the blood of Jesus Christ. So the blood of Jesus is so powerful that all those millions and millions of gallons of blood if you would collect all of them and you would bundle all of them, the blood of Jesus far supersede, is far more powerful, is far more efficacious, it is far more far reaching than all of that blood. And so when we come to Jesus Christ, Jesus is Christ is the unique blood. It is a blood that not only just covers sin, but his blood will eradicate, will wash away, will forgive, will remove sin. This blood is powerful. This blood is unique. And it is offered for every man and woman under the heavens. It is not just confined 
to the Jewish nation. It is not just confined to some, some kind of a tribe or some kind of a people. But no friend, this blood is for everybody. This blood is shed for the, the, the sin of the whole world. This blood retroactively, it goes back retroactively. Forgive all the sins. For anyone that had sinned, if they had faith, the Jewish people, when they were offering all of those laws, all of those sacrifices, they were looking forward to Jesus' death. They were looking forward to Calvary. And so with their faith, when Jesus Christ died, he went down and retroactively forgave all of their sin because they had faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. So this blood is unique. This blood is powerful. This blood is, is wonderful. Someone said the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it shall never lose its power. But it reaches to the highest mountain, then it flows to the lowest valley. This is the blood. Bishop Haywood said, I see a crimson stream of blood that flowed from Calvary. This, this blood is unique. Hallelujah. We may have some deep-seated problem, but the blood. Isaiah 750 years before Jesus was born, he said, but he was wounded for our transgression. When, when the blood flowed, that blood addressed itself to our sins. So though our sin is higher than a mountain, the blood. Somebody said one drop of blood. Hallelujah. Just one drop of blood, there is enough power. There is enough strength. There is enough unction. There is enough, that, enough power in this blood. It is stronger than Ajax. It goes beyond what tide can do. Bleach is, is ineffective when you talk about the, this blood. Hallelujah. It's the crimson blood, but it renders the soul white. Hallelujah. White as snow. Red blood. When, it, when it's applied, it washes white. So there's a uniqueness about this blood. There's a power that is demonstrated in this blood. There's a power that is illustrated when we apply to the blood of Jesus. If you want a revival, the blood of Jesus. You want healing, the blood of Jesus. You want strength, the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Whatever you need, the blood. When we look at Calvary, friend, when we look at Jesus on Calvary, that was the ultimate price for sin. But we need it. Hallelujah. We need it. The mankind needed that blood. Because we are guilty and there's nothing can remedy that but the blood of Jesus. The Jewish people offered the goats and the bullocks, the heifers and all of those things. But that was only temporary. That was only to appease for a little bit. That was only just to cover it a little bit. But this unique blood, this powerful blood that comes from the vein of Emmanuel. It not only covers, but it eradicates, oh Lord. It washes, it removes. He said that it remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. If you notice in John chapter 19 and verse 34, the apostle John said he stood right under the cross. And when those soldiers... They broke the, the, the bones of those two thieves. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. And so one of the soldiers reached into his, into his, 
his for his sword pull that sword out and plunge it into the Lord's side and John said that out of his side came blood and water why, why was that put there it was because Emmanuel's blood had to come out hallelujah that blood you, you, you notice that the priests when they shed those blood when they killed those animals those, that blood had to be collected and it had to be brought in and to sprinkle so Jesus' blood had to flow out and God allowed the soldier to pierce his side and John said a sight I saw the blood that came out hallelujah that blood and if you'll accept it Jesus took his blood into the heavenlies into the real into the true holy place holy of all and he offered his blood and this was a one time sacrifice this was not something that was to be repeated over no just one just one sacrifice just this one sacrifice he has perfected redemption for all of mankind if you notice in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28 so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation so he offered that blood one time when the lord comes back he's not going to be dealing with that he is simply going to bring us to where we ought to be so but by this one sacrifice he has affected salvation for all of us now i want you to know now that satan was unaware of how this unique blood could have affected mankind and his relationship with God. The devil didn't know it. He was unaware. He simply did not know that that blood that was offered at Calvary would forever address the sin question. Because if he did, the devil would never have allowed it. If you notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8. He says, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So Jesus Christ circumvented all that the devil see the devil want to have you captive the devil want to hold you down the devil want to have you under death sentence but Jesus affected the sacrifice that would extricate us from the sphere of the devil's influence he brought us from the place of the those that were held in, in the miry clay of sin from the shadows of death from those that well, in the region of the shadow of death. That's where we and, you and I were, folks. But Jesus Christ affected his blood at Calvary so that he can bring us back to where we ought to be. And by it, he forgave us. He washed us in his blood. I'm so glad that the unique blood that was shed at Calvary, the devil didn't know anything about it. But Jesus did it all. And somebody said the devil throw his net at me. But it didn't reach in time. Hallelujah. It didn't reach in time because Jesus rescued me. Jesus rescued us friend. And before the devil knew what was happening. Man Jesus went. Uh, and he said devil. You know you've got that key. You've had the keys. Of death and hell for a long time. You had all these folks in terror, but I paid the price. I want you to hand those keys over. So John said he, he saw the risen Christ, uh, and the risen Christ said, John, I got the keys. I took the keys of hell and of death. I'm so glad that Jesus took the keys. Uh, so he's going to help me in that prison anymore. I've been set free. I'm like a bird out 
out of the cage I'm like a bird that has been released I've been released from the sin I'm an undeath that held me back and so by the blood of Jesus this unique blood I'm not a slave of sin anymore but I've been set free to worship and to serve God hallelujah that unique blood stronger than the blood of heifers stronger than the blood of turtle dove. this unique blood friend when you plunge somebody said there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein and sinners plunge doesn't matter how much sin you've got sinners plunge beneath this flood Lose all their guilty stain. You can remain standing there because I'm getting ready to quit. Hallelujah. This blood is unique. Thank you, Lord. This blood is by itself. There is no match to this blood. There is no equal to this blood. Hallelujah. But this blood, oh Lord, hallelujah. This blood is strong. This blood is efficacious. You notice in Romans chapter 8 verse 2. The apostle said, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. When we get in Christ, when we get our sins washed away, when we have been purged, when we've been sanctified, when we're justified, it makes us free from the law of sin and death. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. Every sin, every sin is like a debt. Every sin is owed. But Jesus paid it all. Hallelujah. Oh, friend, we had a debt to pay. We had a debt that we could not pay. Someone is that Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Thank God for the blood. Ooh, oh Lord, thank God for the blood. And so the songwriter said, How much I owe since Christ is mine. How much I owe for love's divine. How much I owe. He said, I can't tell how much I owe. But Jesus paid it all. I said, Jesus paid it all. I should have died, but Jesus paid it all. My sin were higher than a mountain, but Jesus paid it all. I was doomed to a devil's hell, but Jesus paid it all. I couldn't see my way out, but Jesus paid it all. I didn't have what to pay, but Jesus paid it all. This is the unique blood. Hallelujah, hallelujah. This blood is shed for the sin of all the world. And Jesus has a prescription. Has a prescription for everyone. If you will apply that prescription, it's like the doctor issue you a prescription. That prescription, friend, is going to it's going to remedy whatever sickness you have. Jesus' prescription is his blood. And if we will apply to the blood, if we will come to that fountain, somebody said, wash you in the blood. Hallelujah. If you wash in the blood, Luke chapter 22 and verse 10. Jesus said, this cup, this cup, this cup, he says, in the New Testament, in my blood, which is shed for you. So Jesus paid the debt that we owed. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, All sin 
is like a debt. And so when we pray and forgive us our debts, what's our debt? Our sin. But I'm so glad that Jesus' blood, that blood, that powerful blood, efficacious, strong, powerful, regardless of how far we've gotten away from God, that blood, if you will come to this place, there is a blood that is flowing and it's flowing for the souls unclean. Jesus' blood will make peace by the death of the cross. The blood, the blood, it, it, regardless, sometimes you, you feel like you're an enemy of God. You've been fighting God, uh, uh, wrestling, you've been away from God, but you can come and make peace to the blood of his cross hallelujah oh the blood that blood we go down with black 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 sin but when we come up we come up white as snow oh what an exchange oh jesus will exchange your debt hallelujah for the peace of calvary if you're here today and you said, I need you, Lord. Jesus is here, friend. 